Hello everyone. Welcome to today's sermon entitled, What Must I Do? You know, one of the distinctions of most churches and denominations is what that church says is necessary for admittance into heaven. Now, if you haven't grown up in church, you may have heard that good people go to heaven and bad people go to hell. That may be a great explanation for a three-year-old but it isn't quite theologically sound. So why are there so many different paths to salvation spoken about, even in so-called Christian churches? Some of the distinctives of some of these denominations in this area are things like this. Baptismal regeneration. You're literally not saved until your body comes up out of the water. So in other words, you could confess with your mouth, Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart, like Romans said, but you're not saved until you get baptized. So that's one denomination's um, idea of what it takes to go to heaven. You know, a lot of denominations or churches and non-denominational churches think it's all about obedience. That Jesus says, if you love me, obey me. So if you're not obedient, you don't love Jesus and you're not a Christian. That's an interesting one. Another one is confess your sins. Keep short accounts with God. Make sure you don't have any unconfessed sin with God because if you just confessed all your sins and prayed and then you're driving on the way uh, you know, to a, a party or whatever and you say a curse word and then you get hit by a truck, you're going straight to hell because you didn't have time to confess. That's, that's, that's some people believe that. Some churches teach that you got to speak in tongues, that that's evidence of salvation. Some churches teach that you can't drink, smoke, chew, or go with women that do, right? If you do, you're not saved. But you know what? What I care about and what we care about is what did Jesus say when people asked him, how do you go to heaven? You know, the answers might surprise you. And I said answers on purpose because he gave different answers to different people. You know, Jesus said that to go to heaven, you need to confess and believe in him. To someone else, he said, love God with all your heart and love others the same exact way that you love yourself. To someone else, he said, sell everything you have and give the money to the poor. You know, to, to another person, he said, become a sheep. In that verse, he says, but you don't believe me because you are not my sheep. So if believing is necessary and you can't believe if you're not his sheep, well, now you got to become a sheep. That's another way Jesus said to get saved. To others, he said, obey the commandments. But let's focus for a minute on one of these, the rich man in Mark chapter 10, verses 17 to 27. So first we're going to read this. It's 10 verses. So hang in there on that, and then we're just going to pick this apart a little bit. But there's a revelation coming that I hope you catch, because this theology that we're presenting today, if you get it right, changes everything about your Christianity. And if you get it wrong, same thing is true. So here we are, um, Mark 10, 17, I believe. As Jesus was starting out on his way to Jerusalem, a man came running up to him, knelt down, and asked, Good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Verse 18, Why do you call me good? Jesus asked. Only God is truly good. But to answer your question, you know the commandments. You must not murder. You must not commit adultery. You must not steal. You must not testify falsely. You must not cheat anyone. Honor your father and mother. I'm going to stop there at verse 19 for a second. That is Jesus telling this man that to go to heaven, he must obey the commandments. That's amazing to me, but that's what Jesus said right here, right? We're going to find out why, because check out the next verse. So we'll pick it up in verse 20. The man says, Teacher, I've obeyed all these commandments since I was young. I love this next verse. Looking at the man, Jesus felt genuine love for him. There is still one thing you haven't done, he told him. Go and sell all your possessions and give the money to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come follow me. At this, the man's face fell, and he went away sad, 
for he had many possessions. Jesus looked around and said to his disciples, How hard it is for the rich to enter the kingdom of God. This amazed them. But Jesus said again, Dear children, it is very hard to enter the kingdom of God. In fact, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God. The disciples were astounded. Then who in the world can be saved, they asked. Jesus looked at them intently and said, Humanly speaking, it is impossible, but not with God. Everything is possible with God. Remember what Jesus said at the end there, because that's going to come back to us. Now, only one of three things can be possible, given the fact that Jesus answered this question differently to different people. One, he was crazy. He didn't know what he was talking about. Two, he was deceptive. I want to tell this guy one thing and tell someone else a lie, or it's all a bunch of lies. Or three, we're missing something here. Um, you know, I don't think he was crazy. This is a, a, a construct that C.S. Lewis came up with called liar, lunatic, or lord. He has to be one of these three. And he is not a liar. There's no evidence that Jesus was a liar. There's no evidence that he was crazy. So what is going on here? He gave so many different answers to this question. It's no wonder we have so many denominations. But there's an important perspective to take into consideration. And that is, was Jesus' primary purpose to teach us how to behave in order to go to heaven? Or did he die on the cross so that we could go to heaven? The distinction is key here. And many, many Christians and even preachers get this wrong. If you reduce Christianity to a philosophy of behavior, you get the most perfect philosophy of behavior that absolutely no one can live by. Christianity is the best philosophy of life out there, in my opinion. But it's one of many. I mean, there's Confucianism, there's Buddhism, Hinduism, the list goes on and on. Pick one. I think Christianity is the best. But just pick one and be true to it as best you can, and you'll probably get to heaven as long as you aren't Charles Manson or Adolf Hitler. That's Christianity as a philosophy. You know, obey the words in red. That's what you hear all the time. But what if the purpose of some of the commands was not that they would be able to be obeyed, but instead the purpose was to show us that we can't really obey even the easy ones. Therefore, Jesus must die. Do you see it? Jesus' main purpose was not to teach us philosophy, even the best philosophy. His purpose was to die as payment for our sins. And when he said these things, he hadn't died yet. So do you see what he was doing? To the humble at heart, he said, just believe. <laughs> to the Pharisees, he said, keep the commandments. And to the rich guy whom he loved, he said, Sell everything you have. You know, some people were ready for a savior because they were lowly. They were under no delusions about their holiness. And that ended up being the people that Jesus kind of congregated that, that came to, to be his followers, you know. He got in trouble for hanging out with prostitutes, wine-bibbers, and notorious sinners because they, they knew where they stood. You know, but others trusted in their behavior or their possessions. So he upped the ante. Whatever they said they could do, he said, well, that's great. You're, if you're trusting at, you know, in that, you, you got to do a whole lot better than what you're doing right now. <laughs> do you get it? He raised the bar to show the need for his death. His mission on this earth was to show God in the flesh to his creation and then be murdered by that same creation. And the Father took this act of sacrifice as sufficient for all of the sins of all who believe, the rich and the poor, the tax collector and the Pharisee. Now let me ask you, is telling an unsaved person to read the words in red and follow the advice a good thing? Depends, doesn't it? It depends on what you think Jesus' main purpose was here on earth. And you must consider the audience and the setting. Now we've already seen that there are many different ways that church is prescribed to be saved. Some are so legalistic about it 
that it would be easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle. This means they're counting on your works. But there really is only one way, believe. And the word translated believe means to put your trust in. Trust in Jesus, in his finished work. Trust in him by faith and you will be saved. You know, one of the most famous preachers, if not the most famous in the world today, uses the story of the rich man to show that we have to be willing to do the impossible for us in order to prove that we have accepted the real gospel. In other words, if at the time of your salvation you didn't really search every area of your life and at least be willing to give it all up to Jesus, you know, like the rich guy and his money, then you didn't really accept the gospel, you accepted easy believism. But let me tell you something. There is no such thing as easy believism. You know why? Because it's impossible to believe without faith. And God gives us that faith. We learned this last week, right? Ephesians 2, 8, 9. For by grace you are saved through faith, and even that is a gift. Try to preach the gospel to someone who has not been given this gift of faith and see how easy it is to believe. You know, this, this accusation of easy believism is insane. Because you know what they say? They'll say stuff like this, because they've said it to me. So what you're saying is because of what Jesus did on the cross, Ted Bundy, in the last five minutes of his life, could ask for Jesus to come in his heart and accept salvation and go to heaven and sit next to Mother Teresa. Guess what they say? That's BS, and they don't want anything to do with it. So it's not easy to believe the gospel. In fact, it's impossible without God's intervention. You know, you saw last week, as I said, even the ability to trust in God is a gift from Him. So listen, if God is tugging on your heart, and if this makes more sense than all of the religious BS that you've been fed in your life, that's evidence that God has already given you the gift of faith. If that's you, I want you to close your eyes and pray with me right now. Dear Lord Jesus, I know that I am a sinner and I ask for your forgiveness. I believe you died for my sins and rose from the dead. I turn from my sins and invite you to come into my heart and life. I want to trust you and follow you as my Lord and Savior. Now those aren't magic words. But if you sincerely prayed something like that, confessing that you're a sinner in need of forgiveness and asking Jesus for that forgiveness and to come into your heart, guess what? You are saved. Whether you feel like something happened or not doesn't change the fact that you are saved. And for those of you that are already Christians, please remember that you did nothing to earn your salvation. When the devil tells you in your mind that you're messing up and therefore not a Christian, both agree and rebuke him. Agree that you're messing up and rebuke the devil for trying to sell you a false gospel of works again. Christian, remember how you came to Christ, bankrupt in the holiness department. See, the problem is with the question. The problem is, what must I do? What must I do, Lord? What must I do, Lord? And that whole time he's walking on earth, he knows what he's going to do for us. So when they come to him and say, what must I do? He's saying, you can't do it. What about me? I can do it. I can keep the commandments. Well, give your money away. You can't do it. You can't do it. So to focus on Jesus' words as the way to heaven, as opposed to focusing on his death as the way to heaven, can be a bad thing. So what must I do? What must you do? You're just going to respond to God's Spirit, and you'll know it when He's tugging on you. You are not the first actor in, the, in this play. God is, and He touches you. And you say, I believe. That's what you must do to be saved. Lord, I just thank you again for the ability to uh, get to do this over the Internet and to get to uh, preach your Word. Lord, I pray that uh, anything that came from you today would would not return void as your word says, Lord, and anything that's for me that's not accurate, I pray you would just let it fall away. But Lord, we thank you that the question, what must I do to be saved, is answered by Jesus has done it. 
You've done it. It is finished. What do we do except a free gift after you give us a gift of faith, Lord? Thank you for all that you've done for us. And please uh, bless this church as we move forward. In Jesus' name, amen.